Okay, so assalamu alaikum. My name is Shahed. I'm a second year medical student and I'll be hosting this PAL session for you. Uh, this lecture is, it has a lot of components, but inshallah it will go fine. And if you follow along, it'll be really easy. So to my understanding, majority of the batch will be watching the recording. So I will be going a little fast on the questions, but I think it'll It'll benefit a lot of people, inshallah. So we can get started. So here we have our learning objectives directly from the lecture. Um, personally, I love to look at the lectures because they're kind of a key to what the doctor is looking for. So if they include them, definitely go over them. And here I've highlighted the important objectives, some high yield topics that you'll need to focus on. So at the end, try to answer these objectives that you know are highlighted. Try to make sure you memorize them. Um, so if we start from the first objective, uh, by the way, everything's going to be included. So anything in the lecture is important, but these ones are the more important ones. So let's get into the next part. So now for the ETC and the oxidative phosphorylation. Basically, this whole uh, concept is utilizing redox reactions. I think this is also, you know, a lot of this is from high school, middle school, you know, so. Sorry, a lot of this is from high school, middle school. So we have the redox reaction, which is reduction and oxidation. Um, I'm just gonna quickly go over this because again, this is a concept that should be set in stone, but if anyone doesn't understand it, I'll just go over it. So a redox reaction is the transfer of electrons from one chemical species to another. So the uh, electrons are the main character basically in these. It's the transfer of electrons from one molecule to another. Most of the time, especially in oxidative phosphorylation, the electrons are associated with hydrogen atoms. And we'll see this applied later on. So we have an image here. We have, um, you just need to understand this concept. Loss of electrons is oxidation. Well, gain, sorry, there's a typo there. Not green. Gain of electrons is reduction. So uh, you can memorize this from a mnemonic uh, oil rig there. I learned that in high school. I think a lot of people did. Um, oxidation is loss. So loss of electrons. Reduction is gain. So gain of electrons. So remember it that way. Now we have, because you're going to need to apply this to the electron transfer chain. You're going to need to say when a molecule is getting oxidized or released. So just to explain this image, we have two molecules here. This first yellow molecule is transferring its electrons to the purple molecules. So what's happening? It's losing an electron. Loss of electron is, sorry, that's my brother. Loss of an electron is oxidation. And this purple molecule is gaining an electron. And the gain of electron is reduction. So I hope this concept is clear. You just need to remember this for the molecules later on. Um, another thing that's important is the NAD and FAD. These molecules came from glycolysis and uh, the Krebs cycle. Uh, from these molecules, uh, I think this part will be explained in your vitamins lecture, so you don't really need to memorize it for this lecture, but it is important to go over. So NAD is B3 or niacin, and FAD is B2 or riboflavin. Again, this is in your vitamins lecture, so that's when you're going to focus on that. And NAD and FAD are cofactors or coenzymes. Basically, they just aid the reaction by adding something to it. Um, that's basically it. You know that NAD and FAD come from glycolysis, electron transport chain. I think those were discussed in previous lectures. So you should have a good understanding of these. OK, now for the electro electron transport chain. So what we need to know is the electron transport chain or oxidative phosphorylation happens in the mitochondria. And where exactly in the mitochondria is in the cristae. And the cristae are basically folds of the mitochondria. They're basically folded to higher the surface area. Another thing you need to know is the final electron acceptor is oxygen. Now, this might not make sense now, but we will get to that. And just to go for a brief overview, Electron carriers alternate between reduced and oxidized states. They accept and donate electrons. So before we get into this, we're going to go to this diagram here. So this is just a quick overview of the electron transport chain or oxidative phosphorylation before we dive into the components. So 
we have in our mitochondria, we have our layers. Again, we're in the cristae, the folds of the mitochondria, the folds of the inner mitochondrial membrane. So here's our membrane. Here's our mitochondrial matrix, which is more to the inside of the mitochondria. And this is our intermembrane space between the, let's say here is the outer mitochondrial membrane. Okay, so we have our carriers or our coenzymes here, NAD, coming from glycolysis or from Krebs cycle. They're coming from another house and they're entering the mitochondria. So at the mitochondria, they're gonna drop off an electron. So what did we say that the loss of an electron is? If anyone can remember, use the mnemonic. What is the loss of an electron? Yes. Euleric, yes. Oxidation, exactly. So the loss of an electron is oxidation. So this molecule is undergoing oxidation. So we have our electron entering the first carrier here. Then the electron is just passed on to another carrier. At the first carrier, we have elect we have hydrogen item atoms inside the mitochondrial matrix. So just try to follow me here. Every time an electron is deposited at a carrier, a hydrogen atom will be shunted out, oops, will be shunted out of the carrier into the intermembrane space. So as the electron passes the carrier, it gets a hydrogen atom and it just goes out. It gets passed on to the next carrier and the next one. And again, we have the hydrogen atoms moving out into the intermembrane space like this. The next one over here and down here, another hydrogen atom outside. So what this creates is a proton gradient, which basically means that there's a difference in concentration in the two areas. So in the intermembrane space, we're going to have a high concentration of hydrogen atoms, while in the mitochondrial matrix, we're going to have a low concentration. That's by the end of it. And one thing to note here, as you can see, the electrons are following the shape of the membrane until the last carrier, where it is brought back into the mitochondrial matrix. So this is where we bring back our previous point when we said the final electron acceptor is oxygen because the electrons that have been passed to the membrane are brought back into the mitochondrial matrix onto oxygen. And oxygen is the final electron acceptor. So basically it takes this electron and it becomes water. Um, after this, we have our hydrogen atoms inside the intermembrane space. And at the end of all of this, the final carrier will bring back the hydrogen atoms into the mitochondrial matrix. And this is called ATP synthase. ATP synthase, so ATP synthesis. ATP is bound with phosphate to make ATP. So that's the overall mechanism for the electron transport chain. Um, you do need to know the carriers, unfortunately. It does take a little bit to memorize, but it'll be okay. So we'll go back and get to the carriers. After, you know, I felt like it would be easier to explain the carriers if you knew the concept of the electrons. So components, another statistic, don't ask me my source, it's confidential. 99.9 um, to 3% chance you'll get at least one MCQ about the following slides. So just take everything after this as very high yield because when I checked the sources, which I cannot name, um, there was questions about this like a lot. So take care of this. So let's get on to the um, carriers. Okay, so before I move on, we need to break down what exactly cytochromes are. Um, it's a really basic concept, so you don't really need to look into it too much. But uh, at its core, if we have any transporters or carriers or anything that's uh, working in our body to move something from somewhere else, we need to identify it as a protein. And these kind of work similar to... I mean, you can connect it to red blood cells because they have heme groups and they work by reducing and oxidizing iron. So if we, move, if we look at this point here, cytochromes are proteins with heme groups. They include a porphyrin ring and they oxidize and reduce iron from Fe2 to Fe3 and vice versa. Um, there's also something called cytochrome P450. You'll look into this more in your second year during your POD block. 
and it's basically used for drug metabolism, breaking down the drug to activate or deactivate. So another part that is new to your slides is the COQ10 supplements. Oops. So these alleviate muscle pain, and some people taking statins or water statins, they're basically just cholesterol medications. Uh, there's currently not much evidence to support this, this part here. So it's unlikely that they will test you about something that's um, not basically confirmed, but it is good to know since it is in your slide. So just know that uh, COQ, coenzyme Q, which we will get to, coenzyme Q10 supplements are used to um, bring down or alleviate muscle pain in some patients. And you should remember that it's statins for cholesterol. Okay, so we have a list of carriers here. These are in order, but I doubt you need to know the order very well, but you do need to know these extra parts here. So let's start from the start. We have complex one, number one, the first one, and it's called NADH dehydrogenase. So as we said here, the NADH is dropping off its electron. And what is this first carrier? Complex one. And that's why it's called NADH dehydrogenase, it's because it's accepting the first electron from NADH. So as we said, the NADH is getting oxidized. So remember this, complex one, NADH dehydrogenase. It's the first step in the ETC, and it's the first one. So that means the electron is starting at complex one. After that, it just gets passed to coenzyme Q, you can see here, COQ. And after that, complex three, it doesn't have anything special just another hydrogen ion getting shunted out. And then cytochrome C, again, nothing special, just memorize these names. But then finally we get to complex four, which is cytochrome oxidase. Um, as we said in the second to last carrier, we have the oxygen accepting the final electron, or it's the final acceptor of electron. So we name the carrier accordingly. So the it's complex four, cytochrome oxidase, and it transfers electrons to oxygen. Um, after that, we have complex five, which is ATP synthase. That was the final, final one. Um, I'm not sure why he didn't include complex five in the list, because it's a little confusing like that. So I just included it here, but um, it is important because he does mention it later on. So just to go over it again, the NADH starts at complex one, NADH dehydrogenase. It passes its electron to the coenzyme Q while pushing out a hydrogen atom. Then it passes on to complex three. Another hydrogen atom is pushed out. Then to cytochrome C, to complex four, another hydrogen atom out. Complex four is cytochrome oxidase. The electron is being accepted by oxygen, which is the final electron acceptor, getting converted into water. And then finally, we have our hydrogen atoms coming back in through complex five, which is ATP synthase, and this is what makes the ATP. So that's the whole thing. Um, after this, we just have a word form, if anyone just wants to read through that. Um, just very quickly, electron transfer drives hydrogen pump or mitochondrial matrix into intermembrane space. Then hydrogen moves back in through ATP synthase, as we said, drives phosphorylation. Uh, what drives ATP synthesis? The proton gradient, which means the hydrogen ions are higher in the intermembrane space than the mitochondrial matrix. And coupling of ATP synthesis to NADH and FAD. Oxidation, we call it phosphorylation, oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, um, does anyone have any questions about this part? You know, it was a lot at once, so I hope it was clear. Okay, clear, crystal clear. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll go on. Then. Um, so as you noticed, we have went from complex one straight to complex three. We skipped complex two. And this is set apart from the others for a reason. This is because complex two is the only carrier that does not push the protons out into the intermembrane space. So um, as you can see here, this complex two is actually kind of part of the Krebs cycle, which I think you've covered before. So um, since you know this part, just associate it with complex two. So complex two is also known as succinate dehydrogenase. So what does that do? It'll catalyze the oxidation of succinate into fumarate. Uh, this was in the 
prep cycle, so I think you should know it, but it's okay if you don't. You can just memorize it from here. Um, the electrons move from FADH to coenzyme Q. So the difference between this one and the ones we just discussed is, first of all, it has no protons pumped out. And the second thing is that FADH is the coenzyme being used. Meanwhile, in the other one, we had the protons being pumped out and we started with NADH instead. So I hope that's clear. Another thing to note is that NADH will give us three ATP, while FADH will only give us two. So that's high yield, but it's good to know. Okay, I hope that's clear. Okay, Let's move on then. So um, this is a very, very important topic, again, from my sources. This came in almost all the past papers from our sources. It came in almost all the sources. Um, so you need to memorize these. Uh, you need to memorize these very well, like the back of your hand, because if you take away one thing from this lecture, take away these these names and what they do. So if we start here, we have rotenones and barbiturates. What they will do, since they're the first ones we're mentioning, they'll inhibit complex one. So rotenone barbiturates. And just to make sure you're following along, what does this block? What ox what what action do these block? What does complex one do from the electron transport chain? Remember that complex one is the first one. So it will accept something from something. What is that? I'll give you five seconds. Electrons from NA. Yes, exactly. Exactly. It's stopping the acceptance of electrons from NADH here. So we're just going to look at on this image. You can see that rotenone, also barbiturates, should be here will block the acceptance of electrons from NADH. So it blocks the first step. Next, we have cyanide and carbon monoxide, CC, will inhibit complex four. Again, what does complex four do? What's the importance of complex four? Uh, transfer the electrons to the oxygen. Sorry again. Uh, complex four, four it uh, it transfers electrons to oxygen. Yes, exactly. Yes, someone in the some people in the chat also. Yes, exactly. Good job. So it transfers the um, electrons to oxygen, the final electron acceptor. So cyanide and carbon monoxide will block this step here. It'll block the acceptance of electrons to oxygen. And this is this step is very important for the energy. So that's a big problem. Okay, and finally we have oligomycin, which blocks proton proton channel of ATP synthase. So uh, the same as the other ones, it's just basically putting a door in the channel and it's not letting any more hydrogen atoms come in. And this hydrogen atom coming in is what drives the synthesis of ATP. So this is a big one. So just to go over it one more time, rotenone and barbiturates inhibit complex one. Cyanide and carbon monoxide inhibit complex four. Oligomycin inhibits ATP synthase. Memorize these like your name, please. Came in a lot of the sources. Okay, I hope that's clear. Um, you might be, okay. One more thing to mention is that if we have, actually this is for the next part, okay. Um, just to go into a little bit more depth about the inhibitors, we have cyanide poisoning and carbon monoxide poisoning. Poisoning is a not a pleasant word, so of course not pleasant things are gonna happen. So cyanide binds irreversibly. Take this as a rule of thumb, anything that binds irreversibly to anything in our body is bad. Even if it's a drug or a medicine or anything that's supposed to help us, um, practitioners, doctors, whatever, they all try to avoid things that bind irreversibly. So obviously this is a very uh, bad thing. So it binds to complex four, 
and it prevents electron transfer from to oxygen because we said that it inhibits complex four, as you guys said, which is the transfer of electron to oxygen, and it produces many of the changes seen in tissue hypoxia. Um, they might give you a patient presenting with tissue hypoxia, and of course, there's a lot of things causing this. It's a very broad topic, but within the scope of your understanding, you should connect it to cyanide poisoning. Um, tissue hypoxia, I'm not sure if you've done it, but it's basically that the tissues in the body are not getting enough oxygen. Hypoxia, not enough oxygen. And finally, next we have cyanide poisoning, or carbon monoxide poisoning, sorry. Um, it binds to complex four, same thing, but less tightly. But this is still bad because it's still blocking it. And from your CVP block, you just finished your final exam. I hope it went well. Um, it binds to hemoglobin and displaces oxygen. So that's just going over them quickly. I think that's fine. Okay. I hope everything is clear so far. We're going to move on to the uncouplers. So the uncouplers are kind of similar to the inhibitors, but not as much. So the thing that sets the uncouplers apart from the inhibitors is that they don't stop the transfer of electrons. They don't block the electrons from moving on, but instead they bring the hydrogen atoms back in to the mitochondrial matrix without generating ATP. So I don't have an image here, so let's go back to this one. Um, so what uncouplers do is that they'll change the permeability of the inner mitochondrial membrane. They'll change the leakiness or like the spaces, and this will cause hydrogen atoms to leak back into the mitochondrial matrix. Um, obviously this is pretty bad because they have to pass through ATP synthase to generate um, energy, to generate ATP. So if they're just leaking back in, we're not generating ATP and the proto proton gradient is being diminished. So if there's less proton gradient, less protons or hydrogen atoms will pass through ATP synthase less energy will be made. So we'll go over it here. They're different from inhibitors because they don't stop electron transfer. Instead, they are lipophilic weak acids and they increase the permeability of the inner mitochondrial membrane and they facilitate their movement back into the mitochondrial matrix without generating ATP. This process uncouples the electron transfer chain from ATP synthesis and gets rid of the proton gradient. So the inhibitors will block the transfer of electrons, while the uncouplers will bring the hydrogen atoms back in and stop ATP synthesis. Um, one more thing, the hydrogen atoms, which are brought back in, obviously they're carrying energy. So what does the body do with this energy? Because, you know, we can't create or destroy. It has to be repurposed. So the energy that's being brought back in, or the hydrogen atoms, are instead released as heat instead of ATP. So a patient like this will present very hot, so they'll be sweating, you know, there's gonna be their skin and it might be hot or whatever organ is using this. So another from our sources, these um these names are pretty important. So also memorize these along with the inhibitors. Um we have two for DNP, which is probably the most important one that you'll need to remember. Aspirin and UCP or thermogenin. UCP is just uncoupler protein. So just remember these names. They're the uncouplers of the ETC, electron transfer chain, from the sources. Okay, um, we're gonna expand on thermogenin in brown adipose tissue right now. So what is brown adipose tissue? If you've seen a newborn, you probably have. There's, they have a lot of um, fat on their body in very, a lot of areas, um, mostly their neck and their upper back. So uh, this helps them produce energy without shivering. And basically shivering is when you're, you know, your muscles are going like this, going against each other and they're generating heat. But for newborns, they don't need to do all that. They have the brown tissue and they make use of uncouplers. So the mitochondria in the brown tissue adipose contain a protein called uncoupling protein one or thermogenin. That's the one we just mentioned here. And since we know, since we mentioned, the hydrogen atoms which are being brought back and not being utilized for ATP are released as heat instead. So energy is lost as heat, and that's how the BAT is being utilized for heat instead of ATP. Um, I hope that's clear. Give me the green light.
Okay, clear. Okay, great. Green, thank you. Okay, we're moving on to the last concept. We're gonna wrap up soon. The last concept of this um, lecture. Okay. Uh, mutations in mitochondrial DNA. There's not much to know about this, but you could slip it in. So just know that um, most of the proteins, not most, some of the proteins being made for the ETC are being made in mitochondrial DNA instead of nuclear DNA. And the mitochondrial DNA has a much higher affinity for mutations being 10 times greater than nuclear DNA. So if we have any mutations in the ETC, that's probably a result of mutations from the mitochondrial DNA. Um, this will affect tissues that need a lot of energy, like the CNS, skeletal, heart, liver, you know, all that stuff. So just know that some proteins are being made from mitochondrial DNA. Those get mutations, and that gives us mutations in the electron transfer chain. There are some names for this. I haven't seen it a lot in the sources, but you should know them. You know, every time they give you names of diseases, that's general rule of thumb. Try to take those as things you should memorize. So we have MELAS, quite a mouthful, mitochondrial encephalomyopathy, lactic acidosis, and stroke-like episodes. Just remember the MEL, yes, they're probably not going to give you the whole thing. Um, then we have ragged red muscle fiber disease and lever hereditary optic neuropathy. Um, I do think the first one is the most important one. If they do bring this in the exam, they're probably going to ask you for this first one. Other than that, do just remember, try to remember these names. You might see them. I think that's about it. I'll just bring two questions from the complexes. So barbiturates will inhibit which complex? Let's see. Barbiturates and rotenone, they were the first ones. We got one C, one D. Okay, I'll just wait a few more seconds. Okay, yes, it is C. No, it's not C actually. Whoever <laughs> said C, it's not C. Um, it's D. Thank you. It is D. Um, let's show it here. D. So if we just go back really quickly uh, to the slide here, we said that rotenone and barbiturates will inhibit complex one. It was the first complex. Um, again, cyanide, carbon monoxide, complex four, oligomycin, ATP synthase. So the answer was D, complex one. Last question, which of the following complexes in the electron transfer chain do not contribute to the proton gradient? Is it complex, complex two? One? Yes, it is complex two. Thank you. The answer, as we said, the comp uh, as I mentioned, the complexes jump from one to three. We skipped number two, and the exception to this is that it uses FADH instead of NADH, and it does not shunt any protons into the intermembrane space. Okay, we have finished the lecture. Um, I hope that was. All right, I hope you guys benefited. And if you can scan the code to put a review, then that would be great. Otherwise, if you guys have any more questions, then I'm here to answer them. Thank you so much for this uh, nice uh, PAL session. I really, uh, I really like learned a lot. I'm glad, alhamdulillah. Hata also refreshed, from one or two two weeks ago. So it's a nice refresher and it's a very nice uh, pad session. Okay, alhamdulillah. I'm glad it helped. Inshallah, the people who watch the recording also benefit. Okay, you're welcome. You're welcome. Glad to help. Okay, um, I think we can stop the recording. I don't think there's any questions.